Wer hängt denn hier hinten so rum? Dr. Chuck was. Yes, Commander. Is there something you need? How well do you know the Lieutenant? I'd never worked with him before this mission. But he has an impressive service record. Over a dozen special commendations. Tends to keep to himself, though. Maybe because of the headaches. It's not easy being an L2. What does that have to do with it? Well, most biotics now use the L3 implants. Lieutenant Alenko was wired with the old L2 configuration. Sometimes there are complications. What kind of complications? Severe mental disabilities, insanity, crippling physical pain. There's a long list of horrific side effects. Caden's lucky. He just gets migraines. How did you end up serving on an Alliance ship? I enlisted right out of med school. Earth always seemed boring to me. Too safe. Too secure. I figured the colonies were teeming with exotic adventure. I wanted to travel the stars, tending the wounds of tough soldiers with piercing eyes and sensitive souls. <laughs> Turns out military life isn't quite as romantic as I'd imagined. But humanity needs the Alliance if we want to keep expanding through the Traverse. And the Alliance always needs good doctors. So I stayed on to do my part. Ever think you made the wrong choice? Sometimes I think about opening a private practice back on Earth. Or maybe taking a position at one of the new med centers out in the colonies. But there's something special about working on soldiers. If I left the Alliance now, I'd feel like I was abandoning them. I should go. Goodbye, Commander. Anything you need, Commander? Just trying to get a sense of where the crew's at. Thoughts? I've wasted enough of your time for now, Commander. We'll have time for personal debriefings later. We'll talk another time, Lieutenant. Commander? Die Belichtung ist ein bisschen komisch. Was ist hier? Also. Ah, okay, da hinten ist auch nichts. Ich muss auch sagen, die menschlichen Squad-Mitglieder, bis auf einige Ausnahmen, sind die uninteressanten meiner Meinung nach. Weil das sind für mich irgendwie die ersten, die man kriegt, mit denen geht man auf die ersten Missionen und dann kommen halt die interessanten Leute. Zum Beispiel er hier. Thanks for bringing me on board, Commander. I knew working with a Spectre would be better than life at CSAC. Have you worked with a Spectre before? Well, no, but I know what they're like. Spectres make their own rules. You're free to handle things your way. But CSEC, you're buried by rules. The damn bureaucrats are always on your back. Being a Spectre does have its advantages. Exactly my point. If I'm trying to take down a suspect, it shouldn't matter how I do it, as long as I do it. But CSEC wants it done their way. Protocol and procedure come first. That's why I left. Von Shepard tut schon so, als wüsste er viel darüber, ein Spectre zu sein, obwohl er fünf Minuten ein Spectre ist. So you just quit because you didn't like the way they do things? There's more to it than that. It didn't start out bad, but as I rose in ranks, I got saddled with more and more red tape. C-Sex handling of Saren was typical. I just couldn't take it anymore. I hate leaving. I hope you made the right choice. I'd hate for you to regret it later. Well, that's sort of why I teamed up with you. It's a chance for me to get off the Citadel, see how things are done outside C-Sex. Either way, I plan to make the most of this. And without CSEC headquarters looking over my shoulder, well, maybe I can get the job done my way for a change. If getting the job done means endangering innocent people, then no. We get the job done right, not bad. Got it? I wasn't trying to. I understand, Commander. Nice ship you've got, Shepard. What can I do for you? What's your story, Rex? There's no story. Go ask the Quarian if you want stories. You Krogan lived for centuries. Don't tell me you haven't had a few interesting adventures. Well, there was this one time the Turians almost wiped out our entire race. That was fun. I heard about that. You know, they almost did the same to us. It's not the same. It seems pretty much the same to me. So your people were infected with a genetic mutation? 
an infection that makes only a few in a thousand children survive birth? And I suppose it's destroying your entire species? I suppose it isn't all the same. I don't expect you to understand, but don't compare humanity's fate with the Krogan. Sorry, Rex. I wasn't trying to get you upset. Your ignorance doesn't upset me, Shepard. As for the Krogan, I gave up on them long ago. The genophage infected us, but it's not what's killing us. Are your people really dying? We're sure not getting any stronger. We're too spread out. None of us are interested in staying in our own system. What can you tell me about the genophage? Ask the Salarians if you want details. They made it. All I know, it makes breeding nearly impossible. Thousands die in stillbirth, and most never get that far. Every Krogan is infected, every one. And no one's rushing to find a cure. So long, Rex. Also sie werden uns im Verlauf der Geschichte auch mehr über sich erzählen und das wird sich auch noch auswirken. Your ship's amazing, Shepard. I've never seen a drive cord like this before. I can't believe you were able to fit it into a ship this small. I'm starting to understand why you humans have been so successful. I had no idea Alliance vessels were so advanced. The Normandy's a prototype. Cutting-edge technology. A month ago, I was patching a makeshift fuel line into a converted tug ship in the flotilla. Now, I'm sitting on board one of the most advanced vessels in Citadel space. I have to thank you again for bringing me along. Traveling on a vessel like this is a dream come true for me. I had no idea you found ship technology so interesting. It comes with being a Quarian. The migrant fleet is the key to the survival of my people. Ships are our most valuable resource. But we don't have anything like this. We make do with cast-offs and second-hand equipment. We just try to keep them running for as long as we can. Some of the fleet's larger vessels date all the way back to our original flight from the Geth. I can't believe your fleet's still using ships that are three centuries old. They're constantly being repaired, modified, and refitted. They aren't pretty, but they work. Mostly. We've tried to make ourselves as independent as possible on the flotilla. Grow our own food, mine, and process our own fuel. But some things we just can't make on our own. A patch to maintain the hull integrity requires raw materials we just don't have. That's why our pilgrimages are so important. Tell me about your people. Our lives aren't easy. Resources are scarce, and we are constantly on the move. Everything we do must in some way contribute to the continuation of the migrant fleet. There are 17 million Quarians in the flotilla, and each of us relies on the others for survival. The bonds among my people are strong. Unfortunately, we have had to surrender many of the freedoms and civil liberties that other species take for granted. What kind of freedoms? Well, it's illegal for parents to have more than one child. If our population grows too much, it would strain our resources to their breaking point. Of course, we also can't allow our numbers to become too few. If our population is in decline, the rule against single births is temporarily repealed. In extreme cases of population decline, incentives are even offered to encourage multiple births. Though the Conclave hasn't had to take such measures in nearly a century. That's your government. The Conclave is our civilian branch of government. Each ship can elect a representative to serve on the Conclave and make decisions that affect the fleet as a whole. On matters that affect an individual ship, however, the captain has the final say. It's a tradition that dates back to the early days, when the fleet was governed by martial law. Fortunately, most captains nowadays are smart enough to have an elected council from their crew to give them advice and guidance. So the ultimate power rests with elected officials. In practice, the Conclave and the respective council for each ship tend to set the rules that govern our daily lives. 
but in theory we are still under military jurisdiction. The five top-ranking military officials in the fleet serve on the Admiralty Board. These five have the power to overrule any decision by the Conclave in case of emergency. To do so requires unanimous agreement among the Admiralty. And they can only do this once. After that, the entire board must resign their posts. It's a safeguard that served us well. In nearly three centuries, the Admiralty Board has only overruled the Conclave four times. I want to know more about the Geth. I doubt I can tell you anything you don't already know. It's been almost three centuries since they drove my people into exile. All I know is the story of their origins. What they were when we created them, and how they turned on us. Interesting. The Geth were originally created to serve as an automated manual labor force. Initially, their intelligence was as limited as any VI. Over time, we made small modifications to their programming to allow them to perform more varied and complex tasks, bringing them closer and closer to true AI status. How come the Council didn't step in and stop you? This wasn't true AI research. We may have been skirting the bounds of the law, but we never did anything that was actually illegal. The changes were so insignificant, so gradual, that we were able to control them. Or so we thought. But one thing we underestimated was the power of the neural network. A million Geth thinking simultaneously created an inherently unstable matrix. So, the Geth share brain power? Many of the Geth's logic systems were designed to work in concert with other nearby Geth. Basically, the more of them you have in a group, the smarter they are. So there's some sort of group consciousness? No, nothing like that. They cannot share sensory data or information. Their programming cannot handle that much simultaneous input. Each Geth maintains an individual awareness and identity. The neural network only operates on a process-based level. It's basically the synthetic equivalent of a subconscious. But, when they're in close proximity, they can coordinate low-level functional processes, freeing up more capacity for original or independent thought. That doesn't make any sense. I'm probably oversimplifying. The Geth are incredibly advanced and complex creations. All you need to know is that they get smarter when they gather in large numbers. As we built more and more Geth, their effective intelligence became more sophisticated, more abstract. One day, a Geth began to ask its Quarian overseer questions about the nature of its existence. Am I alive? Why am I here? What is my purpose? As you can imagine, this caused a near panic among my people. I don't see what's so bad about those questions. The Geth were created to engage in mundane, repetitive, or dangerous manual labor. That's fine for machines, but it won't satisfy a sentient being for long. The Geth were showing signs of rudimentary self-awareness and independent thought. If the Geth were intelligent, then we were essentially using them as slaves. It was inevitable the newly sentient Geth would rebel against their situation. We knew they would rise up against us. So we acted first. A general order went out across all Quarian-controlled systems to permanently deactivate all Geth. The Geth responded to this order violently. You can't blame them for fighting for their survival. We had no other choice. The Geth were already on the verge of revolution. By acting quickly, we had a chance to end the war before it began. The hope was that most of the Geth would still be little more than machines, incapable of organized resistance. But they had progressed much further than anyone anticipated. The war was long and bloody. Millions upon millions of Quarians died at their hands. In the end, we were forced to flee our own homeworld. We feared the Geth would pursue us, but they never came beyond the Veil. Now, we drift through space, exiled, searching for a way to reclaim what was once ours. I want to know more about the pilgrimage. When my people reach maturity, we leave our birth ships and seek acceptance with a new crew. It's necessary to maintain genetic diversity among the fleet. But no ship wants to accept someone who will be a burden on them, 
So, to prove our worth, we embark on a pilgrimage. We set out alone, leaving the flotilla and our families behind us. We only return once we have found something of value we can bring back to the fleet. This is presented as a gift to the captain of the respective ship we wish to join. If the gift is accepted, we are welcomed into the crew. Can a captain choose to reject the gift? Uh, that doesn't happen often. Most captains are eager to increase the size of their crew. It increases their own standing in our society. Even when a gift is not particularly valuable, the captain usually accepts it out of a sense of tradition. However, there is a stigma to presenting a substandard gift. It's not the best way to make a good impression on a new community. Most pilgrims don't return until they find something worthwhile. I can't believe they just send you off alone. It's not like they just cast us out. Before we leave, we are given lessons in how to survive outside the flotilla, and given gifts to help us on our journey. We also receive implants to fight off sickness and disease. Generations of living in an isolated and highly controlled environment have left our immune systems weaker than most. By the time we leave the fleet, we are well equipped for the pilgrimage. This is a rite of passage for all Quarians. If it were dangerous, our numbers would suffer. Virtually every pilgrimage ends with a triumphant return and the ritual presentation of the gift to one of the fleet's captains. I want to talk about something else. Like what? I should go. See you later. So, bevor das noch viel länger dauert. Hey, Shepard. Uh, nein. See you later. Oh. Oh, doch mit ihm können wir noch reden. Das dauert eigentlich mal nicht lange. Hey Commander, you know that quarry in Tally? She's been spending all her time down here asking me about our engines. I'll tell her to leave you alone. What? No, she's amazing. I wish my guys were half as smart as she is. Give her a month on board and she'll know more about our engines than I do. She's got a real knack for technology, that one. I can see why you wanted her to come along. I figured she'd be a real asset to the team. You've got an eye for talent, Commander. But I'm guessing that's not why you came down here. Fill me in on the IES stealth systems. How does it work, exactly? You can't hide a ship out in space. They emit too much heat and radiation. Too easy for sensors to pick them up. Unless you find a way to capture those emissions. So our stealth systems trap the energy we give off in storage sinks built into the ship itself. No emissions to give away our location. Eventually the sinks have to be vented. More than a few hours silent running and they overheat. Cook us inside our own hull. There's no way for anyone to detect us? A visual scan can still pick us up. Anyone looking out a window can see us plain as day. But you have to be pretty close to get an actual visual out in space. Most vessels rely on scanners. As long as the stealth systems are engaged, they can't see us. Not unless we accelerate to FTL speeds. Why doesn't it work with faster than light travel? Cranking up the FTL, blue shifts our emissions, pushes them into frequencies too high to capture in the sinks. As soon as we make the jump, it's like setting off a flare. Sensors can pick up our location whenever we enter or exit FTL flight, but for short-range missions, our stealth systems are amazing. We've got the only one. Where else have you served, Adams? You name a class of Alliance ship, I've probably served on it. Everything from dreadnoughts and carriers right down to frigates like the Normandy. My last assignment was on the Tokyo. Only a cruiser, but she was a good ship. Couldn't hold a candle to the Normandy, though. I want to know more about the Normandy. She's the best ship I've ever served on. Probably the fastest vessel ever designed. She's the only one using the new Tantalus drive core. What's so special about the Tantalus Drive Corps? Proportionally, it's about twice the size of any other vessel. Not only are we faster, we can run at FTL speeds longer before we have to discharge the core. Carry on, Adams. Aye, aye, Commander. Okay. Ich glaube, das war's. Wir müssen noch gucken, dass wir doch der Ashley ist noch da. Sie können wir noch gerade ansprechen. Commander. Do you have a few minutes to talk one on one? I'm sorry, Commander. I need to get my duty squared away. I wouldn't mind talking more later, though. What's your opinion on the last mission? Kinda wish you'd got there sooner, Commander. No offense. I appreciate the rescue. I just wish. You wish we'd been able to save the rest of your unit? Yes, sir. If I had been more alert, we wouldn't have been cut down by an ambush. The Geth are perfect ambushers. They don't move, they don't make noise. They don't even breathe. 
Sir, they have flashlight heads. I'll make sure it doesn't happen again. Dismissed, Chief. Sir. Stimmt, sie haben Taschenlampenköpfe. Ich glaube, so ein Kommentar kommt auch später nochmal. Ich muss nur aufpassen, dass ich nicht mit ihr noch eine Romanze anfange. Äh, Moment, das ist falsch. Nein, nicht laden. So, und bei der nächsten Aufnahme, also wenn es wieder heißt, Let's Play Mass Effect, geht's auch dann los mit der eigentlichen Story. Jetzt war eigentlich nur alles aufbauen. Bis zum nächsten Mal.